Right, so I've I've tested this. Uh, it seems to work. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> Hello! Oh, oh, that's me. Hold on. This mess three? Let me try this again. All right. Okay, hello everyone. All right, this is good. I know it's a little silly that I'm using a mic, but we have some folks joining us um, online, so that's why, so they could hear us clearly. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the sixth seminar of Science Against Capitalism. My name is Saidi. I'm the education coordinator here at the People's Forum. If you haven't been here before, we're a space for political education and cultural work. We have a bunch of open classes, courses, series like these. Um, there's a bunch of really cool programming for a bunch of folks who are united together and struggle to build a better world. So I hope you come back and join us for whatever programming they may be. Um, yeah, so today, welcome. This is our sixth seminar for Science Against Capitalism, a series that has been put on in collaboration with Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, Eco-Socialist Horizons, and with the help of Science for the People. Today, I'm particularly very honored to introduce our two speakers today. First, we have Stuart Newman, who's a professor of cell biology and anatomy at New York Medical College in Valhalla, New York. Stuart was a member of the original Science for the People organization and was a founding member in the early 1980s of the Council for Responsible Genetics. So it's really an honor to have you here, Stuart. And as always, it's a great honor to have our comrades Salvatore and Goldemaro, who's a professor at SUNY New Paltz in the, in the Geography Department, as well as the chief editor for the journal Capitalism, Nature, Socialism, and a huge part in the Eco-Socialist Horizons, as well as author of the book, Socialist States and the Environment, Lessons for Eco-Socialist Futures. So with that, um, feel free to move on up. We're a small crowd, some folks will normally trickle in later, but we have our amazing comrades online, and um, thank you all for joining us today, Stuart Salvatore, thank you always. Many thanks, Saizi, and um, to all the uh, People's Forum comrades for uh, allowing this and enabling, um, helping to make this happen. Um, I wanted to uh, just to reiterate, as I usually do at the beginning, that um, the hope is that there will be more uh, socialists who become involved in the sciences, at the very least getting interested in uh, in, uh, in knowing much more in detail uh, about uh, debates within the different fields of either STEM or the biophysical sciences. Um, but especially if, um, if any of the information, any of the presentations, any of the discussions f that result from these seminars um, inspire anybody to um, become whatever sort of um, scientists in biophysical sciences engineering, maths, um, it is something that um, it is kind of the point of, of this seminar series since um, without, uh, without uh, people with uh, technical expertise who are dedicated to the cause of socialism, it is difficult um, to envision how um, a socialism can be built. Um, and, uh, and so it's that's the importance of this endeavor as well. But if anyone, in, uh, either online or here, uh, or in the past who might be following this again um, later on, is interested in, uh, in um, forming these kinds of uh, discussion groups or seminars, it'd be great to also uh, network about this and to um, um, have report backs and um, and uh, any sort of sharing of, of information so that uh, a network can also be built uh, as as widely as possible of course science for the people have been uh, rebuilding what uh, uh, what someone like our guest today has uh, uh, contributed to um, uh, quite a while ago and it is thanks to him as well um, and also to um, for me, it's, it's especially an honor because um, of the connection with um, uh, Richard Lewontin and Richard Levins, who have been, I guess, indirectly my mentors in, in the kind of scientific work that I've been doing. So it's quite an honor to, to be in the company of someone who uh, was also uh, part of that uh, movement within biology, um, um, sort of dedicated to um, I guess, um, if I may, uh, sort of applying Marx's method to the, stu the study of of, um, of biology. So, without any further, I guess, uh, introductions, uh, I just want to also remind you that 
I have brought um, copies of Capitalism and Asian Socialism for anybody who's interested to take. They're free to take. And, um, and if you're interested in um, any more information about the journal, please see me afterwards. Um, now I suppose I would like to start the conversation finally and ask um, Professor Newman if he can give us an overview of uh, evolutionary developmental biology as a field of study and in terms of what it addresses, how it addresses that um, uh, area of, of, uh, of, of um, or that endeavor and what its significance in terms of what is going on today. Yes, well, thank you. It, really, it's very nice to be here and to meet you in person, finally. After <laughs> um, So yes, evolutionary developmental biology represents um, kind of, I, my colleagues and I think a step beyond uh, the Darwinian uh, uh, way of looking at evolution. So um, Darwin's theory was formulated in the 19th century um, when the uh, kind of the major uh, physical sciences were um, with Newton's um, uh, mechanics, and, and uh, this is even before the sciences of, uh, of thermodynamics, heat, and transformations, and even chemistry wasn't uh, well um, uh, well defined uh, when Darwin started his work. But um, he was interested in uh, a materialist theory of of life. Uh, there were lots of, of course, religious ideas about creation and so on, and, and Darwin kind of, um, kind of came forward and presented an idea about how all the complex living forms around us were generated by um, material means, and he um, kind of referred to, um, to the physical sciences, and um, he, um, he had a kind of a family lineage. His, um, his um, grandfather was Erasmus Darwin, who was one of the first people, uh, along with um, Lamarck, who um, talked about uh, natural types of evolution. But they really didn't have a theory. They didn't have a mechanism for how it happened. They described it as something that was part of the um, physical and material world, but um, they, they, couldn't, um, they couldn't get a grasp on, on how it worked. And, um, uh, but Darwin had another grandfather, J Josiah Wedgwood, who was um, uh, who made uh, th this fantastic uh, por porcelain and other um, ceramic pots, and the, the company still exists. And he was one of the major figures of the Industrial Revolution, and um, he formulated um, the clay pots and the color that he used, the famous Wedgwood blue. And, and he did it little by little, it, it, because chemistry and the physics of uh, materials was not there in place at the time. Uh, he had to go through thousands of iterations to get the clay and to get the color right. And I think that that was as much of an influence on Darwin as his other grandfather was, because his theory is actually the transformation of material objects, living systems, from one form that might be less complex to more complex forms, little by little, in, in gradual steps. Because that was the in, in, uh, industrial technology of the time, and that was the physics of the time. Um, Newton's laws are kind of um, inertia and, and kind of uh, things um, you know, things stay in motion unless they're, um, uh, they're, they're pushed uh, into another direction and so on. So he was working with the uh, kind of material theories of the time. So Darwin's idea is that you get little changes in a population and um, the next generation, the ones that are more successful, uh, persevere and put more members into the population until you do this thousands and thousands and thousands of times, and then you get a different kind of organism. So that was Darwin's theory. Um, evolutionary developmental biology says that, um, no, it, the uh, materials that make up living systems have very dynamic properties to them. They're very changeable. They can reorganize. They can transform. So we, we know now um, the 
fa about phase transitions and about um, processes that give you um, uh, heterogeneous structures when you start out with a homogeneous structure. You, we know about chaotic systems and we know about, they're called self-organizing systems. The, the famous um, computer scientist Alan Turing talked about um, self-organizing systems where you have chemical reactions and physical diffusion and if you put them together in the right proportions, you get structures, you get forms. It doesn't remain uniform. So we know now that, that physics and chemistry have a lot of dynamics to them. So if you want to understand how one form of life can transform into another form of life, then um, you can do it by looking at the material properties of cellular systems, not, not just individual cells, but clusters of cells. They might turn into animals and they might turn into plants or um, other, other forms of multicellular organisms, but um, they have all these kind of unusual forms and patterns to them. And we can understand those forms and patterns based on um, the, <coughs> the physical properties of um, multicellular embryonic systems. So we can understand where these major uh, changes in form can come from. But, but Darwin's theory had another side to it. The other side was um, if something, <coughs> if, if something cha changes, why should it remain? Um, the, Darwin's theory has to do with selection. And the only way that things can change over time is by natural selection. So you get something that's a little different from the other members of its population, why should that one kind of prevail? It prevails because it does something a little better than the other ones. So it's like uh, kind of a very 19th century capitalist idea of, you know, that, that things, uh, you know, that are, are, get be are more successful by, um, you know, being better than uh, the other members of the population or the other companies or whatever. It's a very 19th century. But Darwin's idea was very, based on that m model of change. And the only way that you can get small changes to become large changes is by competition or by confronting the environment uh, and doing better with the challenges that the environment present, okay? Um, for evolutionary developmental biology, it's a little different. It's um, th things that are quite different from their, the other members of their population because of all these nonlinear effects and all these, these patterns that can form. They, they don't necessarily do exactly what the other members of their population do. They, it's, they're not gonna be a, a little bit better than their cousins and their brothers and sisters. They may just kind of go off somewhere and start a, a, a new, they may find a new niche, a new ecological niche that didn't even exist before and occupy that niche and do something completely new. So you have new structures doing completely new things. That's very un-Darwinian. Darwinian, Darwinism is gradual and it's competitive. Competitive against other organisms or competitive against the environment. And uh, evolutionary developmental biology is quite different. So you can see that this is another it's a n nothing to do with creationism, nothing like that, but it's another scientific way of looking at evolution that is different from the Darwinian model. Okay, so what it is, it's coming up against. It's not that, um, not that popular yet. It's, it's gaining in popularity, but um, people resist it. First of all, Darwin took control of the brand. So if you, if you, talk about evolution, almost everybody thinks you mean Darwinism. If you talk about Darwin's theory, that they consider that the theory of evolution. If people in evolutionary developmental biology say, yep, we believe in evolution, but not by the Darwinian mechanism, then sometimes it's said, oh, you're creationist, right? No, no, it's not that way at all. It's kind of better materialism. It's, um, it's more complex forms of materialism. So basically that's the, that's what evolutionary developmental biology is. <laughs> a long uh, answer to a short question. Uh, 
Yeah, <laughs> you've been quite brief about mm -hmm. it. I, um, I, I, I'm admiring actually the brevity. Um, <laughs> the um, the other aspect that I was hoping you might want to touch on as well is is what kind of significance the the field, I mean the 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 framework of evolutionary developmental biology, um, what significance it has for what's going on now, like in general, uh, maybe in the sciences per se, but also uh, beyond. Right. So um, the, the evolutionary developmental biologists and other critics of the uh, kind of Darwinian natural selection say that um, the, this old model kind of looks at organisms as kind of passive. They are um, they're basically what they are. They might be a little different from their neighbors, but the, um, the problems that they're confronting are kind of um, well-established problems and they have to be better at solving those problems. They have to occupy the niches that they originated in and just do better in those niches. But the, the world changes in much more abrupt ways than that and we see it happening all around us with, with climate change and social upheavals and everything like that. And um, our, if organisms were completely passive, they would go under. <laughs> you know, if when things like this happen, they would just, um, it would do them in because if they're perfectly adapted to the situation that they grew up in, then, you know, when they're confronted with things that are completely new, they're not going to do well. But <coughs> part of uh, evolutionary developmental biology is that organisms have agency. They are creative. They, um, they, they, confront the world and figure out how to do new things. And this creativity is not just the human mind. You can actually go all the way down to the cellular level, to bacteria, to, um, to single-celled organisms, and they have agency. They, they, they c somehow, and we don't really understand this uh, at this point scientifically, people are working on this, but um, because of how they're made and their internal structure, they are innovative. They, they, they figure out um, how to kind of live in the world even when the world changes. So um, if we start thinking of other forms of life and ourselves as, um, and not only ourselves, as, as agents, we realize that um, things change in response to change and they're not passive, they're not, they're not selected because the things change and you know, selected against because they don't meet, you know, the challenges that they grew up to inhabit. When, whenever I was confronted with teaching something about this, um, that's what I would come up against. It's like this is just—it's all functionalistic. So how can it possibly be that you have any changes whatsoever? Right, right. So, you know. It, um, the, the 19th century, 19th century science and 18th, 19th century science and Darwin was an example. People were, were kind of moving away from religious ideas and into sci scientific materialist ideas. But um, somehow the, the, the capitalist system and the industrial system made people very uh, reductionist. That is, um, people uh, are kind of taught to believe that, that um, everything that exists is based on the things that it's made of. And, and if you want to understand the nature of reality, you go to the s smaller and smaller levels. So, so basically, um, everything is, is based on quantum, quantum physics or something. Everything is based on atoms, uh, everything. And it's, it's reductionism. Um, one thing that Marx did, and Marx and Engels did, was to understand that um, matter has many manifestations, and there's not one preferred form of matter. Matter can be transformed from one form into another. You can have uh, quantitative changes leading to qualitative changes. But when something new emerges, it's, it's truly new, and it can act back on the lower level, and it can influence how that how that acts. So, um, like people um, kind of coming into the developmental biology is the 
is, is the science of how embryos develop. And it's, um, it, it doesn't, according to many people, it doesn't have much to do with evolution. You can under, understand embryology without understanding how embryos came about in the first place. And, and from the early part of the 20th century, people thinking about evolution said the way things develop, like the way embryos develop, has nothing to do with evolution. And why was this? They, everything was reduced to genes. Mm -hmm. So it, the idea came about, if you want to understand how things develop, well, it's because genes are, are kind of interacting with each other and, um, and they kind of, there's a program and that genetic program creates the organism. And then since everything in biology is supposed to be genetic, the people who were studying evolution said if you want to understand how things evolve, just look at the genes mm -hmm. and count the genes, look at the way the genes change, and then evolution actually became redefined as the change in each generation of the genes that are there or the variants of the genes that are there. So in, uh, in evolution, you had this genetic reductionism and in development, you had this genetic reductionism. But in both cases, the genes were doing completely different things. In, in the case of evolution, supposedly the genes were just causing tiny little innocuous changes that had to accumulate over time. In the case of development, the genes were part of a kind of a computer-like program that was kind of generating the organism. And there was a real disconnect between these two ways of of looking at biology. And evolutionary developmental biology is non-reductionist. It brings those, it, 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 it understands the role of genes and the role of genetic change, but not only genes and, and not only genetic change. It's, uh, this is a way of, of looking at, um, I guess, not just the field of biology, but I guess it could be like scientific endeavors more, more broadly. But in any case, what, you, what you're describing um, is uh, at least two aspects that that um, um, that are um, that were at least being developed. I guess also in in, in Lewontin and Levin's work with respect to the, a Marxist method in in dialectical biologist. And you seem to. I mean, I think you touched upon a couple of those. And perhaps if you could, um, perhaps. Um, elaborate further on, on how this approach of um, evolutionary development biology uh, it can can be um, viewed as as uh, aligned with or um, or perhaps uh, imbued with a, a Marxist kind of uh, outlook and, and and framework right well if you can give us also some examples of that I mean you already have it in terms of yeah. quantity into quality for instance yeah right. Yeah, so it, I think the, what it really comes down to is that um, um, matter can take different forms. I, th there was um, a kind of a school of philosophy that was developed um, in response to reductionism, mm -hmm. reductionist um, understanding of, um, uh, of everything, um, you know, of materials and reductionist understanding of biology. Um, you know, like when you hear like, um, I, the idea that the organism is a machine. That, that's a reductionist idea. You know, if you just know what the parts are and how they interact, then you understand. It. And the smaller the parts, the better. And when you're down to the genes and the molecules that make up the genes, then you really have a, a good understanding of it. But um, as, as, the, as um, biology developed, it was clear that um, there were, in many cases, the whole was greater than the sum of its parts. Okay, so that's, that's basically just a saying. Is that a scientific um, concept? Well, if, if you say that to a reductionist, they say, no, the, the whole is not greater than the sum of its parts. You just don't understand what the parts are doing. Okay, but there were philosophies that came up, with the Whitehead and, mm -hmm. and um, um, the, uh, others, um, and they called it holism. Uh, and, um, and, and they said that there are um, 
kind of higher levels of organization that, um, that kind of acted on the components to make the components conform or you know, uh, act in, in certain ways. And a lot of it was very vague. But um, if you, the only consistent philosophy that really um, understood and, 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 and kind of pointed to the fact that um, there were material factors acting on multiple levels was Marxism. Um, it, it doesn't say that um, like ecological systems, for example, um, are simply based on, on the genes of the organisms that occupy them. Uh, it says that ecological systems have their own um, uh, regularities, their own uh, inherent forms of, of behavior that are based on higher level interactions. It's not simply reducible to the genes of all the occupants of the ecological system. So it's, um, so that's really dialectical materialism. Um, it just says that uh, materialism doesn't occur simply on one level of causation. So, um, I mean, another thing is like the morphogenesis of an organism. The, 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 f the way an, an embryo goes from a single cell to multiple cells that are all alike, and then cells that are differentiated forming patterns and, and, and structures and everything like that. There is a, a physics of the middle scale. It's not the physics, it's not quantum physics, and it's not um, the physics of um, black holes or um, of mechanic, of um, celestial mechanics, but it is a physics of the middle scale. And, um, and living systems live in that physical world and um, things like um, like uh, phase transitions and and um, re what are called in reaction diffusion instabilities, a, a lot of um, uh, formative processes, um, uh, compaction and and um, fa and uh, uh, melt melting of uh, and and um, disassociation. All those things are going on in the middle scale. And um, living, living materials, which are made of cells, um, have particular inherent properties. And those properties are there even before evolution has taken place. They're, they're latent in the materials. And if they are not expressed now, they might be expressed later, but they're easy to find because uh, they're they're latent in the materials. Um, I'll give some examples when I, yeah. I show the slides. But um, so these these latencies, these inherencies, kind of point the way in in evolutionary change. And therefore, one implication is that evolution is somewhat predictable. Mm. So um, if you take a purely gradualist genetic um, view, which most biologists unfortunately still do, they say anything is possible. You know, any, um, if given enough time, you can make any, anything out of a living organism. But no, if you look at the animals, they, the animals uh, diversified um, half a million, uh, half a billion years ago. And they it diversified pretty quickly. And they basically generated 35 different types of animals. They're called phyla. And there have been kind of sub-variations of those phyla into species and so on. But you don't have any new phyla after about um, uh, five, uh, 500, 450 million years ago. You, it stopped. It, uh, the evolution mm -hmm. didn't stop, but the large-scale diversification stopped. So. Um, the way uh, Marx says in the uh, 18th Brumaire, you know, um, men make their history, but they don't make it the way they, they please. Well, evolution happens, um, and organisms make their own evolution in a way. They participate in making their own evolution, but not in the way, you know, not in a kind of unlimited way. There are constraints. There are, there are directionalities in evolution. And this is a very Marxist idea. The idea that um, things are very um, uh, 
capable of changing in many, many different directions, but there are also inherent constraints because of the materiality of, rea of the living world. Fantastic. I mean, <laughs> that's, um, there, there are political consequences to this as well, obviously, sort of, we can touch upon them maybe a little bit later, if, if you would like to show, I could show by some, example. Yeah, I can show some yeah. slides. That, um, okay, so um, this is just um, a, f a figure that represents um, Darwinian gradualism. So Darwin uh, studied the changes in the beak's shape of, of finches um, w when he was on his... Uh, the voyage of the Beagle, um, and um, and he found that um, you know, based probably based on one uh, colonization of of these islands by the, by the birds, um, they eventually diversified because there were different foods available to them and everything. So there was natural selection, and you got different beaks. But in fact, th this is not a great example of evolution because this kind of change is reversible. If you um, if you change the environment and, and, and there have been natural experiments where birds have gone into a different environment and then they go back to the beak that they used to have, you know, over many generations. So evolution, true evolution, is generally irreversible. You don't really get kind of backing up. The uh, other thing on the top right is the peppered mo moth. That's another uh, example of supposed graduated evolution because you have a white moth and then you had uh, the industrial activity caused a lot of uh, uh, carbon covered surfaces so things got dark so the moths um, were picked uh, picked off by birds you know the birds ate them and uh, the ones that were darker and more speckled um, w could evade uh, predation better but this is also reversible um, if the, if the um, uh, environment is cleaned up, you get it going back to the lighter color again. Um, so, but that those are classic examples. As the is the transition from ape to human, and of course it didn't happen that way. There were a lot of branches along the way. Um, there were primates that diversified and so on. You didn't have some linear progression from. Uh, from a, a non-human primate to a primate like that. But that's another kind of classic example of gradualism, as is the, um, the progression of the horse. Uh, this used to be in the Museum of Natural History, this uh, a kind of set of models of these horses. Um, and all you see are the horses getting bigger, which did happen, but um, those different species uh, are not direct um, Precursors of the other. It's a very it's a simplification, but anyway, it shows gradualism. But um, if you look back at, um, let's see if I'm. Uh, oh, can this be advanced? I, it's not working from here. Yeah. So, this this is Mendel's laws of genetics, and you have um, uh, these these pea plants, and they have different shaped pods, and they have different colors, um, and they have different flower colors, um, different uh, k kinds of uh, stem shapes and everything like that. And um, Mendel found that there were factors that he could um, identify by breeding. He didn't know what they were, but they eventually came to be called uh, alleles or genetic variants. And, that, and these are, there are genes underlying these traits. But in Mendel's genetics, particularly where he discovered these factors, it was saltational. Saltation means jumps. And in a single generation, you could get something that looks one way and the next generation looks a completely different way. So Mendel's genetics are saltational, but Darwin's evolution is gradual. So how can you use genetics to understand gradual evolution? Mendel didn't know about Darwin. Darwin um, seems to have known about Mendel, but th they didn't really uh, in 
intersect in any real way. Um, so the next slide. Sorry? Oh, yeah, okay. Thank you, yeah. So, um, so here are, um, this is macroevolution. Th this just shows um, the animals, like the different kinds of animals. Um, you can see there's a set of branches that represent vertebrates, like the rabbit and the, um, uh, the birds and the turtles and so on, the fish. But then there are starfish that are invertebrates, and then there are mollusks, which are invert. Everything else that's not a vertebrate is a vertebrate. Um, there are worms, and there are sponges, and, and, and so on. And these are called the animal body plans. And there are um, uh, about 35, 36 different, different ones. They have different body plans. They all emerged, um, as we know now, in, in a couple of episodes of about 20 million years each, which is very minuscule compared to um, the rate of genetic change that we know about, to give you such varied forms. But nobody's ever come up with a picture like the horse picture or the, um, or the um, peppered moth picture that shows gradual changes that take you from one of these forms into another. So basically, how can... Um, genetic change account for macroevolution. Okay, so the next slide. So the modern ev evolutionary synthesis, which was the, the main theory of evolution until evolutionary development of Audre, or evo-devo, as, as it's called. Uh, um, so to reconcile Darwin's gradualist theory of evolution with Mendel's concept of the gene, it was claimed that every trait was determined by many genes of small effect. So if you have many genes contributing to a trait or causing the trait, if they, each of the genes have tiny effect, then the, the gene can change and you don't get a saltation, you just get a slight variant. Okay, the associated minor changes in phenotype, if they persist, are, are called microevolutionary changes. So the tiny phenotypic changes. So this implies that macroevolution, what we saw on the previous slide, is the result of many iterations of microevolution over vast amounts of time. But any sudden changes, large sudden changes in phenotype, are eliminated. Hope, they're called hopeful monsters. There was a geneticist named Richard Goldschmidt in the 1940s and 50s that had a theory of evolution that said maybe it's based on, on what Mendel was talking about. You know, you got these big changes and the organism was very different and that he called it a hopeful monster. It was a monster, but maybe it could found a new, a new lineage. But he didn't understand why a gene could make such big changes, first of all, and he also was kind of pushed back by population biologists that said, oh no, you know, if that hopeful monster came up in a population that was all trying to do s the same thing, it would fail because uh, it, it didn't come up to be adapted to that, um, that, that niche. It, it wasn't good enough, so it, it would get knocked out. Even Darwin knew about these things because he studied agriculture mm -hmm. and there was this phenomenon called sports, n not athletic sports, but animal, like a, a sheep that had three horns or something like that, they were called sports of nature. And Darwin knew about that and he said, some people think this might have to do with evolution, but no, uh, it, it's only gradual changes can uh, persist. These, these sports um, just have to die out, they, they'll never survive. So Darwin knew about it, but he didn't accept it. Okay, so this was the modern evolutionary synthesis. And that's what Evo Devo is proposing to, um, uh, to kind of displace in a way. Okay, so now let's jump to the next slide. And this is a paper from 1972 by Niles Eldridge and Stephen Jay Gould. And um, 
Stephen Jay Gould was very um, um, kind of overtly Marxist. He, he, he claimed Marxism uh, as his um, f family background and, uh, and, and, and he advocated um, Marxist um, viewpoint. And Niles Eldridge also in a quieter way, but um, he's, he's very much on the left. Uh, he's still with us, fortunately, and, and he's very, very much on the left. Um, and in 1972, they published a paper called Punctuated Equilibria, an alternative to phyletic gradualism. So that's the Darwinian gradualism. And this caused a big fuss. Bec um, and it's, it's that the fossil record doesn't support phyletic gradualism. So um, these are two invertebrate biologists. Uh, Steve Gould um, studied snails, and um, Niles Eldridge studied trilobites. And um, they showed that, you know, the snails might be a, a different shape uh, in jumps, or the trilobites might have a different number of segments. But all, all of the punctuations were kind of within a type. Even, even they didn't, t t they, they saw this as a challenge to Darwin's ideas, but they didn't talk about going from starfish to mammals or anything like that. They, they weren't talking about major leaps. But still, um, there was a tremendous pushback and they were scorned and everything. And, um, uh, and they eventually, because um, they didn't have a mechanism, they eventually said, well, maybe just genetics was speeded up, genetic change was speeded up. So it looks like punctuation, but it really is just a, a speeding up of gradualism. So they, they never really um, embraced the, the jumping theory uh, event ultimately. Um, okay, um, so now let's go to the next slide. 1985, Steve Gould wrote a book called Ontogeny and Phylogeny. Ontogeny is the development of individual embryos, and phylogeny <coughs> is the development of species, evolution. And he draws a connection here, and I think that this is really like the founding document of Evo Devo. You know, people find other things, you know, the discovery of certain kinds of genes that are the same across all organisms. This, this is not a genetic-based analysis. It barely talks about genes at all. But it talks about the mechanisms of, <coughs> of embryonic development and um, <coughs> how if they can be um, <coughs> speeded up or um, changed in... in proportion uh, changed in uh, relative rates, you could get very different kinds of organisms. So basically, um, Steve Gould, very perceptive, he saw that possibly changes in embryonic development was the engine of large-scale changes in, um, in types of organisms. So this is a, a very important book in 1985, but it doesn't really have anything to do with genes, and it doesn't propose a mechanism except kind of relative speeds of uh, developmental processes. Okay. Um, okay, so let's go to the next slide. 1988, 89? What is it? 89. 89, <laughs> another very perceptive uh, book. So this is um, um, based on paleontological work and the discovery of the Burgess Shale in Canada. They found this whole, and they, then they found um, these things elsewhere in China and so on, these um, fossil beds that um, had all different kinds of organisms and all the different kinds of animals in them that we see today, even more that we don't see. Um, about 540 million years ago, and if you go to fossil beds from before that, you don't see them at all. So there's this idea that there was this burst of, um, uh, of kind of creativity, of, of, of kind of proliferation of different kinds of body plans. Something happened back then to kind of make it happen very fast. And then after that, you had a kind of a dropout. There were forms that didn't persist, but all the forms that we see today are present in those fossil beds. So... Um, it says most of the um, 
disparate animal body plans arose together in a short, uh, about 20 million year time span. There was another um, earlier 20 million time span where kind of um, some of the earlier forms emerged before the Cambrian body plans. It was called the Precambrian or Idiocaran explosion. So it may have happened in two phases, but it happened very rapidly. So how did this happen? Again, um, the, the conventional ideas had no mechanism for it, except that maybe um, the climate changed and, and, th and, and genetic mutations sped up or something like that, but it was all the kind of the gene-centered idea. Um, no, no mechanism, but this incredibly perceptive observation. Even the paleontologists were not willing to accept Steve Gould's idea that it all appeared at once. You know, They said there must have been some hidden evolution that we've not seen. We're, we're missing the fossil beds, you know, because they couldn't believe that things could happen suddenly. But Steve Gould, maybe because of his Marxism, he, he was willing to accept kind of revolutionary changes in nature. Okay, but again, no, no explanation. Okay, the next one. So here is a very key book by Mary Jane West Eberhard from 2003 called Developmental Plasticity and Evolution. And she documents many different cases where um, the, sis the developmental systems, the systems that give rise to organisms, embryos and so on, if they're put in different environments or different experimental conditions, they change their form. So it, here's the idea that um, the uh, materials that make up um, developing systems have plasticity, have uh, many different inherent possible states. So in this case, you don't really need to have genetic change in order to get organismal change. You can have uh, environmental change or you can have um, uh, uh, you know, behavioral changes between groups of organisms that induce morphological or phenotypic changes. So this idea about the plasticity of um, development was a very important concept in think rethinking um, the um, role of development and evolution because you could get changes without genetic changes. Genetic changes could later happen and consolidate the changes that, that developmental plasticity um, produced. So there was a, an earlier scientist named C.H. Uh, Waddington that talked about canalization, talked about um, kind of genetic change that could um, uh, take changes that occurred through plasticity and reinforce them and make them more um, uh, reliable, okay? So these ideas were in the air, but um, this was a very, very key book. So like in the water flea, the Daphnia, mm -hmm. um, they, they have a, a certain head structure that if you put um, certain prey in their environment, um, that, that give out certain kind of um, otherwise um, toxic signals or something, the whole head of the Daphnia will, will change in response to those signals. And then the Daphnia will be a better predator against those, those bacteria. Um, so things like that. Um, and also another, another case of developmental plasticity is the um, development of sex differentiation in um, reptiles. So um, if you take turtles and you put them at one temperature, you'll get mostly males. You put the eggs in, in, most in one temperature, you get mostly males. If you put them in another temperature, you get mostly females. And it's the same genetics. It's just that the developmental system is sensitive to in the environmental cues. So if you're in an intermediate temperature, you get an equal balance, but you can, you can skew it one way or another. And actually, environmental pollution does the same thing. Um, one of the, um, the ways that um, the um, effects of plastics 
uh, the, the uh, plasticizers that are used for making, hopefully not in this bottle, but um, the old style of plastics, they had plasticizers, they polluted waterways, and you had, um, uh, you, you had um, alligators that, um, in, in which the males uh, didn't develop their reproductive organs. Uh, and this was called the uh, environmental estrogen hypothesis. And it was, uh, it's become a key um, to the understanding of uh, the role of pollution in, uh, in, in lowering sperm count and, and just damaging developmental systems. But that's not normal evolution. Yeah, but okay. So um, the next slide. So in um, around 2000, 2004, th there was um, discoveries by developmental biologists of a set of genes called the developmental genetic toolkit genes. And it turned out, and, and this is where people, um, the more conventional um, uh, e evolutionary biologists um, count the beginning of Evo Devo because it was found that in all animals, there was like about a dozen or two genes that were used in every animal. Uh, and um, they did these genes. Um, uh, some of them are called the Hox genes. Some of them are called, uh, one of them is called Wnt. Um, one of them is called BMP. They, they, they are chemical signals and they are involved in gene expression. And this toolkit seems to be acting at the beginning of all embryos, no matter what the embryos are gonna wind up looking like. And, and the strange thing about this is the following. If, you, if you're a classic anatomist from like the 19th century, you look at the, um, like the human limb, okay? And then you look at the limb of, um, a, of a millipede, or you look at the limb of a, uh, or the wing of a, a drosophila, a fruit fly. I mean, you, call, you can call them limbs, but they're considered analogous. They're analogs because the, um, the common ancestor of mammals and flies were often just like worms without limbs. Uh, you know, the, there's no, there's no um, what it, what's called variation with, um, with descent that, that takes you from a, a fruit fly wing to a, a human limb, okay? So they're analogs. You can call them limbs, but they're not the same thing, okay? But then, when they discovered these genes, they found that the same genes that were involved in making um, mouse limbs were involved in making fruit fly limbs. You know, how did that happen? Um, so what, what could possibly ex explain that? The, the genes themselves are not making anything. They're just part of systems. And so how do the same genes get involved in analogous systems in very different organisms? Okay, so um, around this time, uh, my colleagues and I started working on this issue. So let's look at the next one. Next slide. Well, I, there, here's something, um, just an example of what I just said, and this is from a recent paper. But we know that um, insects have segments to their body, and we have segments to our body. You, you don't see the segments as prominently, but like our, in our backbone, we have, um, you know, it repeated structures. And when the embryo first develops, it has things called somites, blocks of tissue that give rise to the vertebrae and different muscles and everything. And it's been found, you know, more recently that the, the segmentation processes in uh, insects and vertebrates use the same genes. So that's another case of analogs using, um, using the same uh, toolkit genes. So, so this is the use of conserved genes and segmentation in, in short-germ insects and vertebrates, organisms with no segmented common ancestor. And if you look at this paper, which is a recent paper from about two years ago, you can see that the genes are largely the same that, that are being used. Okay, so that's very paradoxical, according to the older ideas. So the next um, 
slide. So this is um, a brief paper I wrote in uh, 2006 called the Developmental Genetic Toolkit and the Molecular Homology Analogy Paradox. So basically, you could call these molecules, these toolkit molecules, homologous because they arose from the same ancestral gene. They're, they're homologous according to the old way that homology was used in, um, in evolutionary biology, but they were contributing to making analogous structures, which is paradoxical. And um, the solution proposed here is that the, the toolkit genes mediate analogous effects in embryos of evolutionarily disparate lineages because their products mobilize physical processes inherent to multicellular aggregates. So let's say, for example, just to take a simple case that, um, that there, it's possible that you can stick cells together by many different types of um, molecules. But if there's only really one set of molecules that does it for all the, the animals, then that, that's a physical process, sticking something together it's done by one gene, but that cluster of cells can go on to do very different things. So the protein is homologous, but the structures that it forms uh, can be very, very different. The animals can be very different from each other. So that's just a, one simple example. So um, it's, um, so let's go on to the next slide. So the idea that was developed from this is, is called um, dynamical patterning modules. So it's a, it's a combination of genes and physics. So the, a, a very well um, entrenched idea in developmental biology are called gene regulatory networks. And those are responsible for making cells different from each other. But making cells different from each other, like liver cells versus kidney cells versus bone cells versus brain cells, that doesn't explain the forms. It doesn't explain the three-dimensional forms. If you look at those genes whose products, whose protein products, mobilize certain physical effects, and there are very different physical effects. It's not just adhesion. It's the, the physical effect of maybe diffusion, making one end of the embryo different from the other by having a molecule that, um, that forms a gradient. Uh, there are many different ways that physics can influence development. And the toolkit genes, the ones that are conserved across all the animals, um, are ones that mobilize physical effects and give rise to these three-dimensional structures. So, so let's look at a list of those. Uh, the next slide. So these dynamical patterning modules, I gave you the example of adhesion. If you have um, what's called um, lateral inhibition, it means that cells can coexist uh, next to each other in the same cluster because one cell will cause the cell that's next to it to do something different. So you can have two kinds of cells in one cluster. That's another physical effect that is medi and that's mediated by um, a gene called notch. Then you could have um, differential adhesion. If you have notch acting in, in coordination with, um, with the cadherins, which are the proteins that mediate adhesion, you can have two different kinds of cells and if they have different adhesive properties, it's like putting together oil and water they will um, coexist in, in domains, but they won't mix. So you can get another morphology. Wnt can make cells different at one end versus the other. So you can get um, cells forming a cluster where there's a hollow space inside the cluster. Th that's just a result of the physics of um, of cells that are polar. 
and, and then on and on. Um, if you look at um, if you look at the one called OSC, that there are certain genes that that participate in oscillations. They they become uh, they're expressed in a periodic fashion, so that when the embryo grows, it will make a band of tissue that will be different from the band that follows it because there are different phases of the oscillation. So, and the one at the bottom is the mechanism that Turing, Alan Turing, came up with the reaction diffusion or or dissipative structure mechanism, and it's another way of getting periodic structures. So you can see that if you take genes uh, and, and organize them into um, networks that involve physical effects, you can get um, different kinds of morphogenesis, different kinds of, um, of patterns. And if we look at the next slide, you can generate all these different types of organisms um, by using those dynamical patterning modules in some combinatorial ways and, and adding them because they don't all exist at the beginning of the animal. So the next slide shows, the, the diagram shows from going from the bottom to the top getting more and more complex organisms. So there are ancient clusters of cells, then there are things like um, hydra, and then there are things like um, uh, worms, um, and then there are things like mammals. And if you look at them and you look at where these toolkit genes appear over time and the physical effects that they mobilize, they appear sequentially. They're not all there at the beginning. So you can get greater and greater complexity to give you that burst of macroevolution. So, so just to kind of summarize this, you have um, genes, just the way the modern synthesis says. The genes um, um, appear when the animals first appeared. And the, ce the cellular clusters that had those genes have many different directions they could evolve in, depending on which physical effects operate in those clusters during embryogenesis. And then you can get different kinds of organisms and you can get jumps because these physical effects can be non-linear. They can be saltational. So th the next slide. So this talks about the necessary role of organismal agency in Evo Devo. So let's say, so Darwin explained increase in complexity by the accumulation of small gradual changes over long periods of time. No surprises or sudden transformations were allowed. According to the population genetics-based synthesis, organisms that don't conform to the existing way of life or new environmental challenges are eliminated in the next generation. Those that do slightly better become more prevalent. But if complexity increases instead by non-gradual processes, the novelty generating effects of developmental physics. Organisms can use their new traits to survive and persevere, but only if they are active agents. Agency is not part of the modern synthesis. In the modern synthesis, organisms are passive. Agency is not part of it. So I'll end in a quote on the next last slide. This is a quote by Richard Lewinton, a well-known Marxist biologist, one of the dialectical biologists. Um, natural selection is not a consequence of how well the organism solves a set of fixed problems posed by the environment. On the contrary, the environment and the organism actively co-determine each other. The incorporation of the organism as an active subject in its own ontogeny and the construction of its own environment leads to a completely di a, a complex dialectical relationship of the elements in the triad of gene, environment, and organism. Okay, so you can see why Evo Devo is Marxist. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Thank you. It's pretty good. <laughs> Hmm. So, as someone who's kind of like um, um, someone who's not doesn't have that level of preparation to to catch all this, I mean, one of the things that struck me, at least, anyway, is the uh, um, is the not just the non-deterministic nature of all of this, but also um, how the um, let me know if I'm completely mistaken, obviously, but is there also an evolution of these toolkits? Yeah, well... And how that, would that Yeah, how not, would that so occur? Much, okay. not so much. Not so much. The toolkit was established um, uh, half a billion years ago, mm. and there haven't been... Well, there haven't been too many more toolkit genes added. When the... Um, well, when the human brain evolved, there were um, new genes that appeared that were based on the older genes. Mm -hmm. There were new variants. There are, there are genes um, that are variants of um, some of the toolkit genes that are actually um, uh, m mutated so that they enable um, the uh, speech. Um, if you, um, and this is not, the only source of speech, but it's one of the components. And if you take the the version, it, one of them is called the Fox gene, F-O-X gene. Mm -hmm. And if you take the Fox gene version that um, primates or the humans have, um, and you put it into a mouse, the vocalizations that the mouse makes are actually different from mouse vocalizations. Hmm. So it influences the ability to vocalize. You know, it doesn't make the mice talk. Maybe the, you need new other genes, but it's probably not genes. It's not just genes, obviously, but um, there are certain physical attributes that enable speech, and they came in with um, some mutations, okay? So, um, but originally it was thought that it was just the human version that did it, but then they took versions from uh, chimps, and they did it also, hmm. so it's, it's not a human specific thing, but there are some of these variants for other things. For if you look at um, if you look at the um, there are a kind of cell in the brain called um, astrocytes. They're star shaped cells. They're not neurons, but they are uh, glial cells. They they support the neurons. Mm. It um, in in the case of a mouse astrocyte, it has about a dozen different, the astrocyte means star-like, and it has like little um, projections that make it look like a star. If you look at human astrocytes, it could have a couple of hundred or a thousand projections. Mm -hmm. So there's something different about the cells, and that's probably r the result of some genetic mutations. But the basic toolkit seems to have been set 500 million years ago and hasn't changed much since then. So you're getting variants, and it's like, um, if you look back at the Burgess Shale, there are vertebrate-like organisms, or chordate-like organisms, and we're chordates. So our body plans, which are dependent on those toolkits, are conserved for a half a billion years. But the types of, you didn't have humans back then, so, and you didn't have mice even, the types of mammals and, and vertebrates that you got changed mm -hmm. because of kind of, Sub um, versions of of the toolkit, huh? Like permutations of, and uh, so this. I mean, if if that's okay to continue with this, of course. Just um, um, briefly, I suppose. If with this understanding, is it um, is it possible to have uh, kind of a range of expectations about? future evolutionary changes, I mean, especially with the planetary-wide, but also different scales, very different kind of changes with, uh, with global climate change right. that are occurring. I think, um, you know, we can't be too optimistic about it. I, I don't think that we're going to have major biological changes, mm. you know. Um, maybe, you, maybe there'll be... Um, more heat tolerant organisms, and, but we're not going to be changing our body plans. We're not going to be, 
um, it won't be major. It'll be like within within the range that is um, tolerable, but what we're made of. It, it's like um, you know, you can take an ice cube, and you could um, have it at minus 20 degrees, and you could have it at minus 10 degrees, and you could have it at zero degrees. Um, but if you have it above uh, melting temperature, it, it's not going to be an ice cube anymore. So, um, so th there's a limit to how how we can change, but um, but we can we can s survive, and with humans, we can create habitats. But um, if we create a habitat that cools us down by air conditioning, we're going to just make the problem worse. So, um, mm. for for everybody else, and including many of ourselves, so um, that's not the answer either. So. We, we have a lot of agency and a lot of innovative capability, but um, it's not unlimited. Right. Um, sure, it is great that you, they have some questions, and maybe we should just go into those questions. And then there's an, another one that would be more about what kind of path to take in order to achieve what you've achieved. <laughs> which, well, maybe I don't think someone like me would never be able to, to do that, <laughs> but in terms of understanding how one can we can get get to that later. How one could go into a field yeah. like biology and also uh, be um, dedicated to um, socialist uh, um, um, causes. But let's yeah. If we could open to the questions, that we need a mic, I suppose, in order for others to be able to hear as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was really struck by the emphasis on the agency of animals or organisms. Yes. Um, I guess I had a couple of thoughts. I mean, first, um, it, sort of, it made me think of, you know, if dialectical biologists like Lewinton and so on um, were inspired by Marxist historiography to think about ruptures and revolutions. I mean, sort of the histor the, 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 there's been like a turn among historians to focus uh, on animal history and animal subjectivity. And I wonder if there also could be interesting conversations between biologists and historians and, and brief centering animal subjectivity. Um, but I guess I was also wondering um, along these lines about um, from the point of view of like scientific explanation, um, the way that um, you characterize agency or sort of what that looks like, because I could, I could imagine sort of the, you know, for less dialectical biologists, the, the main way they characterize, it seems, uh, as, as an amateur in this, um, um, they characterize um, animal agencies in terms of self-interest, right? And, right? and that being a motivation for action. And I, But of course, agents are motivated by many other things than self-interest, and I was wondering if there's room in these kind of accounts for other kinds of, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is re really, a, really a controversial and very active uh, area of biological research now because um, the more um, experiments are done on um, non-human organisms, um, the more they seem to be um, kind of innovative and idi idiosyncratic in a way that, like if you, if, if you, um, if you want to model an organism and you want to model the agency of the organism, what you do is you might put in a program that says, you know, whenever there's like a, a, a prey species, you know, if you're a, an amoeba and you're chasing after a bacteria, you know, then wherever the bacteria goes, you go and every So basically you put a program in and it follows the program. Will you, will you make it um, uh, do something new whenever its um, environment changes? But but putting a program in a, um, or a set of rules into an, an individual, even though it's called agent-based modeling, it doesn't really turn it into an agent. It just turns it into a computer, you know? And um, it, so, so the question is, is, a, is a, a robot or a computer, can it have agency? Like uh, all the debates about whether the chat, uh, whether the, the AI chat, GPT things, uh, do they do they really th think, um, you know? And um, my my answer is no. But um, I I think that um, since they are based on um, on kind of uh, human inventions, they might have some aspect of uh, of kind of human innovation, uh, kind of uh, as part of their um, 
existence. Um, so, so I guess what I'm saying is that um, people don't understand biological agency, and it's, it's simply not following a program, as you point out. It, it's not that. It's, uh, it's being um, kind of, a it's having the ability to innovate, uh, to do something that, that the programmer didn't anticipate, okay? That, that's what agency is, and, th and there are no computer models now in which um, uh, we can be sure that um, true agency is being exhibited. Um, I am curious whether um, Levin's ever um, talked about uh, Evo Devo and his writings or how that um, uh, interacted with his ecological um, work. Uh, do, you, do you know, would you know anything about that? Yeah. Um, I think that um, he, he was very sympathetic to it. He, he didn't, uh, none of his, I actually knew both Levins and Lewinton, and, um, and, and um, Levins didn't really um, d deal with developmental systems but he, de he dealt with um, uh, organismal uh, a agency innovation. Um, he, he didn't believe that um, the um, organisms that were part of ecological systems were, were kind of passive expressions of their genetic composition. And um, when Levins and Lewinton wrote The Dialectical Biologist in the 1980s, um, each of the essays in that book were written by one or the other of them. Uh, I, d I don't think, there might have been one essay that they collaborated on, but it was mainly um, one or the other. And that um, quotation I had from Lewinton at the end. Uh, it's in what was, uh, sorry? That's in the, di yeah, but it was a paper that appeared two, year, two or three years before the dialectical biology, yeah. That essay called The or Organism as the um, Subject and Object of Evolution was published in a, in a journal called Scientia um, before it appeared in Dialectical Biologist. But they both signed on to their points of view uh, of, of all that. And that, um, that essay is considered to be one of the founding essays of what's called niche construction or niche, uh, niche selection, uh, which is now a whole field that is complementary to uh, Evo Devo. And Lewinton's essay on that, although Lewinton himself um, put the, the uh, roots in Kap uh, Kropotkin's work, 19th century work, uh, early 20th century, uh, a book called Mutual Aid, which was a counter to Darwinism. Um, Lewinton saw the roots there, and Levins was uh, definitely a big advocate of Kropotkin. So this uh, agency side, the innovative organism, they both signed on to, and uh, but neither of them were developmental biologists. One online, oh, that was loud. Um, someone asks, you mentioned that capitalism engendered reductionist, reductionism. Would you be able to elaborate on how its economic structure leads to reductionism and or sociomorphism? Okay, so, um, yeah, I think that, um, there are many ways that uh, an economic system can incline people to thinking reductionistically. Um, if, um, if somebody is um, a factory owner, they, they, they think of their workers as, um, as, as kind of uh, elements in the productive process and they don't think of them as people. Now, in, in all walks of life, not everybody manifests every aspect of what they are, but um, if the economic system is based on treating people as interchangeable parts, it, it just inclines you to think a certain way. Um, uh, and, and if there is, um, you know, if there's layoffs, you know, well, that's just part of economics. You know, if there's, um, you know, um, uh, policy changes that lead to, um, uh, you know, housing being destroyed or something, well, that's just economics. So th there's that side of, of reductionism, uh, thinking about people as uh, 
uh, as interchangeable parts. But then um, there is the, the manufacturing process. Um, in the 20th century, in the 21st century, manufacturing is based on um, modern physics and, and uh, you know, that the, the dynamics that we know that are part of the natural world. So there are a lot of, uh, you know, all, all cutting edge physical processes that are uh, understanding of physical processes that are used in manufacturing. But in the 19th century, when capitalism really took hold in the, in the, the Industrial Revolution, it was mainly trial and error. You know, there was, um, there was very little in the way of, um, you know, advanced physics beyond mechanics being used. And um, so everything was looked at as a mechanical problem. Um, uh, very little of you know the dynamics of modern physical science and chemical science was was used until the system was already in place. So like when somebody like Darwin was growing up, you know science was mechanics. And um, so I, I said that cap when I said capitalism engendered reductionism, well it was because they both came up at the same time and they just and they um, established certain habits of of thinking about um, the um, manufactured world and the human world and everything like that it doesn't mean that everything that capitalism you know got into afterwards is necessarily reductionist but it's just the habits of thought that was started when most of the people living in the, the industrial system you know were kind of coming into their um, their thought processes. There's a interesting essay by um, Simon Pickvance. Does that name ring a bell at all? Simon P Pickvance. I don't no. know. Well, um, it's in that it's called a life in the in the biology lab. It's in a, a volume called Radical Science Essays. Um, and uh, anyways, the uh, um, on reductionism, um, I remember there was this f funny little uh, cartoon in that essay um, that is like has the the slugs that um, Stephen Jay Gould and uh, Lewontin or I forget who else, but um, it's Pick Vance, the author of this, was working on the, that slug research, yes. the snail research, right? Um, and in that, he, he kind of he draws in order to kind of show the reductionist tendency of biology, he he shows that. The slug with like um, each person labeled uh, as like this is um, this is Stephen Jay Gould's part of the slug that he studies, and I yeah. study this part. And he felt that that was uh, Pick Vance, um, who later dropped out of his uh, PhD program at Cambridge because he was so uh, um, disillusioned with all with all of it. Um, like the the comp compartmentalization of yeah. science um, was also a part of the reductionist trend, like that you couldn't study the, the function of the whole animal. Right. You had to study a tiny section of it that, and, and that he related that back to um, capitalism. I, I forget how yeah. exactly, but yeah. yeah. I mean, the, definitely um, capitalism is interested in, cert in certain objectives and you might, and the objectives are limited and you would only focus on those aspects of a system that can increase those objectives. And um, so there may be one company that is trying for one thing and another company for trying for another thing and they may use different aspects of, um, of the manufacturing process, but they, they are, um, they're, they're focused. And that, that is kind of contrary to understanding the whole, um, kind of ecological interaction among uh, the, the components of the natural world. Um, yeah, kind of two different questions. Uh, one of which is like, the first one is concerning why did Evo Devo become more popular in the 2000s? I mean, like, more specifically, like, why do you think that there's a relationship between, like, the end of the Human Genome Project and the, f the set of conclusions that were anticipated and then didn't come to fruition right. and the rise of like a differential understand a different understanding right. that yeah. was latent prior, but you know. 
Yeah, that's a very important aspect of it. Yeah, so um, the um, because of the real genetic ge genetic reductionism uh, of you know several different branches of science, they they try to promote the human genome project, which costs a tremendous amount of money by saying we're going to solve the problems of all of biology by just finding the genes that are um, involved in uh, all biological processes. And it turned out, so there was a prediction that there were going to be like 100,000 human genes. And um, when they sequenced the genome, they found there were about 20,000 human genes. And actually, um, uh, some invertebrate organisms and some plants have more genes than, than humans. So genes didn't track with what we call consider complexity. And um, this was like kind of coincided with the discovery of this toolkit mm -hmm. and the fact that um, these conserved genes were responsible for all the major features of uh, kind of body organization of, of the animals and the, the plants have their own toolkit. So there was this real um, kind of rethinking of what the, the relation between genes and biological traits, it, it was inevitable. You know, I, if you could speculate that there are more genes and more complex organisms, then uh, you're not called to, you know, to task on it. But if you then sequence it and find that, no, it's not the case, then you have to find out other sources of complexity, other mechanisms that make things complex that are not solely genetic mechanisms. So yeah, Evo Devo had been brewing for a long time but people started taking it more seriously when they realized that the genes were, were not a blueprint, you know. So, like, um, if you look before the, the genome was sequenced, they talked about the, um, the genes being um, a, a blueprint or a program for development. And then afterwards, the more prominent people, like Eric Lander and so on, said, no, no, the genes are just a parts list. You know, we have to figure out what puts the parts together, and that's developmental biology. Um, the genes themselves don't organize themselves. So um, they changed their vocabulary on it as well. Yeah, did you have a follow up? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So I'm actually uh, involved in a larger scale project with Anna Soto. Anna Soto is a is a cell biologist at Tufts University that studies cancer, and and um, she sees cancer as a kind of social. Um, uh, phenomenon among cells, and she's an anti-genetic reductionist, and um, so she talks about cell societies and um, and about agency and um, uh, about um, this conflict between the uh, cells' um, uh, reproductive capability and and their um, kind of forming, uh, becoming uh, kind of socially domesticated and so on. So yeah, it's. Um, it, it's very relevant. It, it kind of brings in the, these ideas of, um, of, of communication and, and agency be of cells. So, um, and this is a whole trend. So like in um, cancer biology, um, you might think that y y a tumor is like being um, completely uh, untamed. You know, it's like cells arise and then do something that are, um, you know, is totally unsocial. But in fact, th the cancer cells themselves form their own societies and they do, uh, they have their own, w what we call dynamical patterning, they, they pattern themselves to kind of put out, uh, you know, uh, tendrils and metastases and so on. That's not simply a, a, an unsocial thing, it's a kind of a, a, a neo-social thing. It's it's a kind of a new a, a kind of they they form a little revolution in the body and uh, and do something completely new uh, that way. So um, it's not simply 
um, going from domesticated to undomesticated. It's kind of redomestication, you know, for a different purpose, which is their own uh, survival. Uh, I guess I'm kind of struggling to conceptualize this a bit, but like given the, I guess as we talked about earlier with like not having full like ability to reduce the system after the human genome project and development of like, I guess newer science in terms of like looking at splice variants or the epigenome and like sort of getting more uh, into like looking for new ways to reduce in a, in a certain way. Um, I guess what is the role of sort of like I is there a role for any sort of reduction in terms of like identifying like once you find we realize that things are more complex than some and like discovering all these little parts are like right. is there a role for reduction in any sort of way in any sort of sense Reduc reduction of one level to another yeah, yeah. well you know because um because the material world has the possibility of inter interchangeability, you have what, I mean, the, the standard reductionist idea is called upward, ca upward causation. You have, um, you know, atoms that cause molecules, that cause macromolecules, that cause, that's upward causation. Downward causation is you have um, global structures that then tell the molecules what to do. So, so basically, um, Downward causation is the less accepted idea, but it is kind of a more of a Marxist idea. So it's like saying um, in a society, a human society, um, that, you know, there are the material means of production and, and so on, and then there are individuals. Well, do individuals ever have a role in history? Yes, of course they do. Um, but um, the, the major trends in history are caused by social events that are collective events but, um, it, and the relation between societies and uh, productive means. So that, that kind of defines major trends of history, but it doesn't mean that you don't have upward causation as well. So yeah, it, I wouldn't call it reductionism, but I would call it multi-level determination. going to butcher this word. Oh, sorry. I'm going to butcher this word, but someone has a question. <laughs> has Evo Devo had to interact with the history of lysenkoism? Yeah. Oh, yes. Has that legacy harmed the perception of the research? Yeah. So um, <laughs> lysenkoism was um, a kind of a distortion in the Soviet Union of, um, of economic policy that was kind of tied to a kind of a really one-sided idea of, um, uh, of uh, genetics um, w kind of dismissed the role of, of genes and, and um, made um, kind of the environment more important in determining the fate of organisms. It w it's kind of like um, a rudimentary version of Marxism, for the, you know, a distorted version of Marxism. Uh, but it was like um, um, Lysenko who wasn't really a, a scientist, but was like a, uh, uh, was trained as a scientist, but then just became like a commissar, um, uh, took a, a kind of a, um, uh, an unde undeveloped idea about uh, determination of organisms by their environment and said, you know, that's m more important than the genes uh, and, um, and yeah, it was a real distortion of um, of agricultural policy, and uh, the the main thing that it did. But Levins and Lewinton wrote about Lysenkoism, mm -hmm. and they said that actually the implementation of this um, you know this model d didn't cause worse production than the um, Darwinian model did. But the real bad thing about it is that they killed all the scientists that believed uh, in genetics, you know, and they, uh, you know, they, they jailed them and so on. So it distorted science in a, in a very profound way in the Soviet Union. I mean, they eventually kind of crawled their way out of it, but, um, but the, the thing is that there are fashions in, um, you know, in policy, and they come and go, but um, 
you know, it, it becomes more of more than a fashion if it's used to to kill the um, you know the other side or to you know to suppress the other side. Like you can see things going on in um, the debate about COVID, that COVID origins. Um, the um, uh, it looks it's becoming increasingly likely that. Um, uh, some kind of genetic engineering of viruses in, in the Wuhan lab was involved in creating the virus that caused COVID. But um, to say that when Trump was saying it, you know, became a racist thing, or at least according to some people. So scientists who said, well, you know, look at these projects. They were actually proposing to genetically engineer coronaviruses, you know, in Wuhan, you know, and, uh, and actually it was American money that was used and some American labs were involved in it. It wasn't just a Chinese thing, but it became uh, impossible to say that without being kind of called a conspiracy theorist and people were actually, you know, their jobs were being threatened if they said things like that. So, um, and it's still not resolved, you know, but, um, so far, they haven't killed anybody for advocating the laboratory, um, uh, y you know, uh, origin of COVID. Um, but th that uh, idea is is really taking hold, and it was suppressed. It was suppressed in in Nature magazine and Science magazine, and uh, you know, suppressed as far as people getting grants to look into it and so on. Yes. Uh, well, on that note, it's like you were also involved in a lot of members of science where the people were involved in like defining and making um, responsible genetics or society for responsible genetics. Um, and like, it would be great if you can speak about like the relationship or the motivation behind like spending so much time thinking about evolutionary developmental biology within the backdrop of many, many ethical and moral concerns that were present in the 70s and 80s. Right. Yeah. And today. Yeah. So um, th this, uh, this was some of the things you were going to ask me Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I came to be an evolutionary development biologist kind of a little bit after I was educated. So my education was in chemistry. Um, but I was always interested in biological problems and the relation between chemistry and, and biological complexity. And um, um, when I was a graduate student and a postdoctoral fellow, at, I was at the University of Chicago, and Levins and Lewinton were both at the University of Chicago during that period. It was a brief period, but we all kind of coincided. They were senior to me. They were professors, and I was a student and a postdoc, but, um, the, and the Vietnam War was going on at the time, and um, the, also the civil rights struggle and, and so on. So there were a lot, of, um, a lot of things that biology was being used for um, that were quite negative. They were, um, and chemistry, they, they were making napalm to uh, destroy crops and, and then eventually, um, you know, harm people in, um, well, they, they, no, sorry, they, they make herbicides to destroy c crops, Agent Orange and, uh, and napalm was to destroy people. So things were coming out of science that were really negative. And also science was being used, um, or pseudoscience was being used to, um, you know, to say that um, uh, inequalities in society were based on genetics and not, um, and not uh, differences in, um, in, in opportunity and wealth and so on. So uh, there were a lot of bad uses of science. So Science for the People came out of, out of that. And uh, I was um, educated in chemistry. I actually started getting interested in developmental biology because I thought, well, here's a field that at least is not going to be used for any, anything bad. Mm -hmm. but, um, but eventually they decided to think about genetic engineering of people, and I got involved in, in that, uh, opposing that, opposing 
the use of um, developmental biology to try to create superior kinds of people and, and so on. So um, that was one of my activist um, tracks and I'm still involved in that because they, they're going straight ahead with that. They, they want to use CRISPR to make new kinds of people and uh, improved people, improved in quotes, and, the, and they, they want to use developmental biology to, um, to make um, uh, sperm and egg in dishes and then pick out the ones that are you know, most favorable um, you know, for the, the desires of the, the parents and, ge and genetically engineer traits in that the parents might not have. This is going great guns now. They haven't, they, 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 they did um, genetic engineering of uh, embryos in China and there are apparently three children that we don't, we don't know how they're doing but um, they arose from that, mm -hmm. that process. So I've been very actively involved in, in opposing that but um, in the um, late 60s and early 70s there were just many different ways that biology was being used in negative ways. And um, this, the Science for the People group were, were not people that said, well then let's just dump science or let's get out of science. They wanted to stay in science, but they wanted to help steer science away from, from those um, awful things. And um, so that's still going on. The Council for Responsible Genetics um, um, arose around 1980 uh, mm -hmm. and it was founded by people who, many of whom had been involved in science for the people. But it was not, it was not, um, it, it was not a, an extension of science for the people, it was a, it was a new initiative. Science for the people um, was kind of defunct by then. But um, the, the um, Council for Responsible Genetics took its place in, in kind of in, in the biological realm. Um, and, um, and now uh, there's a new science for the people that kind of looks back to the earlier one, but also uh, some of the people influenced by the Council for Responsible Genetics are involved in that. Mm. If I may, I'd like to um, point out how modest uh, Professor Newman has been <laughs> about what he has achieved. Um, and uh, I do encourage everyone to look into his publications. One of which that I would like to highlight actually dovetails with what we we're just discussing. And that is um, his book that came out, I think, four years ago, uh, Biotech Juggernaut. Um, and where you can also find, I, I suppose, perhaps you would like to explain this further, but I suppose it's kind of an application also of, uh, of what you've um, developed as an approach in, in, in uh, evolution, uh, evolutionary development uh, biology. Right. I want to add one more thing before I forget, however, that which I did forget earlier, and that we have uh, capitalism and nature socialism be extremely honored to ha to host not a few of, of his works and if anybody's interested they um they they also have very critical works with respect to how genetics are being used among other things and so if you're interested in in that i'd be more than happy to share those aspects but yes yeah thank you and i was very happy to be um and i continue to write i wrote m most recently uh, um an appreciation of Richard Lewinton, mm -hmm. for who died um, about a year and a half ago for capitalism, nature, socialism, because he was um, Thank you. Yeah. one of my um, kind of mentors. I've, um, I, I actually met Lewinton when I was six, when I was fifteen. Um, mm -hmm. He he had been a recent graduate of uh, Columbia University graduate school, and he was living in uh, a professor in Rochester. And uh, he, he would travel down on Saturday mornings by train to teach a bunch of high school students at, at Columbia. I, was a, uh, I went to high school in New York and uh, I would attend these, these lectures by Lewinton on Saturday mornings when I was um, 14 and 15 years old. But then I re-met him again when I uh, went to Chicago as a graduate student. But, um, the, and um, Levins and Lewinton, um, 
had uh, a column, a, 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 a continuing series mm -hmm. in Capitalism, Nature, Socialism for a number of years. And they, a number of their very important essays were published there. And then um, when um, they stopped doing that, um, I had met an pre editor previous to you, Karen Charman, and mm -hmm. she, um, I met her through a friend, and, and she asked me if I wanted to kind of uh, take up that series. So I, I did it for a number of years. But, um, um, but uh, um, you you asked me about um, oh. well in um, in biotech juggernaut oh yeah biotech um, juggernaut yeah how that I mean I'm, mm. I'm sort of seeing a continuation right. of of your work in yeah. evolutionary development biology being applied right so that, that really yeah. um, that book was was um, generated with a, a, a historian. Um, mm. A, a friend of mine named uh, Tina Stevens, mm -hmm. who um, is an activist in Berkeley, but she's also a um, she's a scholar, uh, and she looked at the um, um, people called bioethicists. Uh, it's a profession of people who are supposed to scrutinize biotechnology and biological science and warn people about the ethical implications. And what she found in an earlier book of hers is that these bioethicists were just kind of part of the program. They were just, their profession was to kind of interpret the, the new um, developments and make them palatable, no matter how bad they were, make them palatable for the general public. Uh, there's a few exceptions, and we talk about it in the book, but mainly the, um, bioethicists are not really that ethical <laughs> as a profession. They um, uh, they're, they're just kind of selling biotechnology. So um, we, she asked uh, me if I would c collaborate with her in writing this book because um, in order to understand how biological science is being distorted in order for it to be uh, acceptable to the industrial process and palatable to the public, they have to kind of lie about it. And um, it's not easy to see where they're lying and um, you need somebody with a technical background. So we wrote this together with me kind of reading with the bioethicists and uh, other uh, bioentrepreneurs were saying and just pointing out how it was really distorting, uh, the, you know, and, and making promises that, are, that can't be delivered and in principle could never be delivered because biological systems are too complex to engineer the way they want. So that's what that book is about. So it does relate to my understanding from Evo Devo, mm -hmm. but it really, you know, is really fortified by this critique of the bioethics profession by Tina. It's an amazing way of <laughs> integrating political commitment with um, scientific work. Thank you. Um, there's another question, so perhaps, and. The time is a bit limited, but um, do you? Do you? I'm sorry. I just wanted to ask you know, just to uh, for those among us who would like to pursue uh, something of the path that you have. Um, how have you become a socialist evolutionary developmental biologist in the first place? You, you, you've given a lot of indications in terms of yeah. life-changing um, experiences. But uh, what path would you recommend to become someone who is interested in pursuing such a yeah, uh, I th field? I think it's very important. I, I actually um, I went to public high school in New York City, in, in Jamaica High School in Queens, and um, uh, I had some amazing teachers there that, um, that not only after we took the basic science courses um, and kind of moved on, to not only taught um, I, I, there was actually a biology teacher of mine that basically taught an early version of Evo Devo, uh, Herman hmm. Guillory, and this was in 1960, um, wow. <laughs> a long time ago. Uh, and I had another teacher that um, uh, taught us, he, he was um, taking graduate courses in the history of science, and he taught us about how science, um, you know, starting from the, um, you know, the Babylonians and the Egyptians, you know, how it had changed and how different concepts, you know, were not permanent, but were kind of related to the times and underwent constant revolution over time. 
And uh, I, so I had an idea not only about what contemporary science was at that time, but how science was mutable, science changed, and that there were no ideas that lasted forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, this was a real big influence on me. And um, so I always kind of uh, kept uh, a historical and, and kind of humanistic side in studying mm -hmm. science. And um, then when I was at the University of Chicago, that's where they developed the um, initial stages of the Manhattan Project, of uh, yeah. the, um, the atomic bomb. And um, in the department I was in, they had a conference on the 20, on the uh, the 25th anniversary of something called the James Frank Letter. So there was a professor at the University of Chicago in in the 1940s named James Frank, mm -hmm. who eventually won the Nobel Prize in in uh, physics, and he was part of the Manhattan Project, and he said, and this was before the bomb was dropped. He said, this is not going to turn out well. And he wrote a letter to, um, to Roosevelt, no, no, to Truman. It was, in, um, it was after Roosevelt had just died. He wrote a letter to Truman, which had signatories of a lot of the Manhattan Project people saying, whatever you do, don't drop the bomb on a population center. You know, you might want to demonstrate it somewhere, show what it could do, but don't drop it. It's going to create this arms race. It's, uh, you know, lots of countries are going to try to get the bomb, you know, they're going to, uh, the technology is going to proliferate, and it's going to make a very dangerous world. And, and this thing was completely ignored, mm. but they had a commemoration of it while I was a graduate student, mm. and that was very influential on in me, that scientists tried to take control of their own scientific work and make it not used for, you know, the most damaging of all purposes. So. Um, yeah, th these things were very influential for me. If one wanted to pursue, though, um, a, yeah, a I doc mean, PhD in yeah. biology and also be a committed socialist, how, how, how does one go about yeah, it, however? It's, uh, yeah. There's no, there's no <laughs> <laughs> good track for it. <laughs> if you, you could do this work but, and read what you know, people have uh, done with, with the research that is not reductionist and not... Mm -hmm. um, and there's more of an opening for it now. There's more, mm. you know, Evo Devo is, is becoming a more established idea. And it's not the only, I mean, in neuroscience, there are um, different ways of looking at the brain that are not completely reductionist, you know. So there are these uh, trends that are starting up in all branches of biology uh, that are open to uh, new ideas and, and non-reductionist ideas. And if you keep that, connected to uh, an understanding of what's going on in society, then, and never lose that. Uh, that that's the important thing. Right. Thank you, everyone. A round of applause for Stuart and Salvatore. Thank you, everybody. An honor to be in space with you, Stuart, especially as a native New Yorker. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, thank you, everyone, for coming out today. We hope to see you again on May 24th, where we'll have a seminar on the role of mathematics and what that can do in helping us understanding, understand capitalism and building the new future. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Many thanks to you all. Thank you very much. Take care.